Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. It's good to be with you all this evening. I have to say, uh, I love Wednesday night church. I love that the groups are sometimes a little bit smaller. Not that more people aren't welcome. Not that we wouldn't love to have more people, but I love the... It feels just more like a family get-together, you know. So I love, I love Wednesday nights. I'm glad y'all are here tonight. Um, I want to start by just reading from the book of Psalms as a quick call to worship, as it were. And so from Psalm chapter 95, beginning in verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Let's pray together. Lord, we come in the middle of our week, in the middle of our labors, to gather with one another, that we might know you, that we might fellowship around the cross and what Christ has done for us. And Father, we thank you tonight for the blood of Jesus. Even as we work, even as we are occupied with our labors during the day, our sins are covered by his blood. And Father, I thank you that even now and throughout the day today, Jesus has been and is and will be praying for us. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be with us tonight as we, as we look at your word, as we think about your word. And I pray you would knit our hearts together in fellowship. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, tonight I want to do something that maybe is a little bit different than what we have been doing on Wednesday nights. And I, I say that with full knowledge that I really don't know what we've been doing on Wednesday nights, so it probably will be different. Uh, but what I wanted to offer for you is tonight I want to give a brief update on the Southern Baptist Convention. I was there last week. I've had a few people ask me questions. Now, I'm not going to bore you with stuff that just seems tedious and that nobody cares about, or at least I hope not. But I at least want to give you an update. You as a church, uh, you sent my wife and me as, mis as uh, messengers to vote on things. And so just as a report to the church, I'm going to be very brief. At our next business meeting, I can elaborate more if there's any questions, but I just want to give a brief update on that. And I wanted from there to kind of jump off as a talking, as a, as a transition talking point into what it means for us to be a church and specifically a Baptist church. And so we'll, we'll think through that a little bit tonight and I'll, I'll get more in detail as we get there. Um, I want to start off by, again, just giving you a quick recap. So the Southern Baptist Convention was last week. Um, every church that gives to the cooperative program is able to send messengers or delegates, if you want to think of them that way, representatives, to go and vote on stuff. Now, the stuff we're voting on is basically how to spend the money that every church gives. And so it's uh, mostly boring stuff, motions and seconds and calling of the question and an amendment to the motion. And then we debate that amendment and then we debate, you know, so it's mostly tedious stuff that you would probably fall asleep. I was doing good to keep my wife awake. But it, it is a good time to go. And I think it is important that our church, as long as we're going to give to that organization, that we have a say in what the organization does. Now, I'm looking around the room. I'm going to bet most of you have been Southern Baptists about as long as I've been alive, which is how long I've been a Southern Baptist. But I do want to give, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, I just want to give a little bit of background. What exactly is this thing we call the Southern Baptist Convention? Well, I won't go into the full history of it, but essentially, if you think about other denominations, they have kind of a top-down structure. The most obvious example of this would be like the Roman Catholic Church. They have the Pope. And he has cardinals, and they have regions, and they set the rules, and they tell those churches what to do, how to practice, how to do things. Uh, other church bodies function similarly. So if you're an Episcopalian church, you have the Archbishop of Canterbury, and 
he's got his bishops under him. And they tell those churches what to do, which books to use and what calendar. So it's a very top-down structure. Baptists, on the other hand, we as Baptists, we believe very clearly that the Scripture teaches each local church is what's called autonomous. That is, each local church decides what that local church should do and how they should function, who the pastor should be. So you don't have a, a bishop that sent me to you. We believe that the, the church prays about and, and raises up leaders and calls those leaders and affirms them. And so this idea of the autonomy of every local church is one of the distinctives of being Baptist. Now, where this comes into play is in the 1800s. Really, you could go back to the 1600s in England, but also in America when there were Baptist churches here. Baptist churches began to realize very clearly that they were not the most numerous, they didn't have the nicest buildings, they didn't have the wealthiest members. And so every local church might struggle to support missionaries or to support planting another church. So Baptists in regions like Philadelphia and Charleston got together and said, you know, we ought to join together and plant churches and train future pastors. And we ought to join together. So they did. They began joining what's called associations. And so the pastors and other people at those local churches would get together at different intervals. And they would bring money from their church that they could put together to send out missionaries to places that didn't have a pastor. As a matter of fact, my great, great, I'm going to lose the greats. I don't know how many. But I have a great, 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 great grandfather named Richard Smith. And he was sent from North Carolina to what is now Bleckley County to plant the first Baptist church in Bleckley County. And so uh, he was sent by other Baptists who supported his work because there was no Baptist church in that area. And it was possible because of those associations getting together to do that. So, all right, getting back to the SBC. So the Southern Baptist Convention started in 1845, but what it was is all the churches in the South and some other churches in some other states said, hey, we can only do so much as a local church, but if we pool our money together, we can do great things for the Lord. And so that's how it got started. That's a very brief version of it. But there's a couple of things that were important uh, about being a Southern Baptist, and that is uh, they, you need to make sure the people you're cooperating with Believe what you believe and want to plant churches in a like-minded way that you want to plant. And you want to make sure that they believe and teach and affirm the scripture. Uh, there's more we'll say about this later, but, you know, the scripture gives us commands over and over and over about holding fast to the teaching that we've been taught. So the early churches were taught by the apostles. They had the gospels. They had Paul's letters. They actually had the living, breathing apostles to come among them and teach them things who then they themselves had heard from Jesus. And there's the exhortations over and over in the New Testament to hold fast to what you've been taught. Don't deviate from it. Don't let other people come in and try to pervert what you've been taught. And Baptists have always taken this very seriously about guarding this deposit that's been entrusted to us. And, and some of these warnings that we see, uh, for example, in Scripture, uh, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Listen to what Paul says to the church at Corinth. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. So this is an important teaching, obviously. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, there, there's a warning right there. Hold fast to what I teach, because if you don't hold fast to it, you're showing that you believed in vain. You didn't really believe. And then he explains what he means by the gospel. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And he continues on. So Paul is right there saying, 
I preached to you the gospel. Then he summarizes it, and he gives a brief summary, and he says, this is the gospel, that Christ died in accordance with the scriptures. He died for our sins, just like the scripture said, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And Paul is, is encouraging them and also kind of warning them, hold fast to that. Don't deviate. Don't chase the newest thing that you hear from somebody who claims to be speaking on behalf of apostles. This is the gospel. Hold it and, and guard it. Uh, we also see in Galatians, so Paul has a much stronger warning to the Galatians. See, the Galatian church, or the churches in Galatia, had moved away from what Paul taught them, that they were saved by faith alone. And so some people came reporting to be from the apostles and said, oh, well, it's not just faith. You've got to be circumcised, too, and you've got to keep the law. And listen, listen to what Paul says to them. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Accursed. So Paul doesn't take it lightly. The churches guard their doctrine and their teaching because the salvation of men is at stake, right? Uh, not to give too many examples, but there are a lot of churches today that teach what we would call, based on Scripture, a false and distorted gospel. Uh, one example I'll give right off the top there is, again, the Roman Catholic Church. Their version, their what I would call a distortion of the gospel, is that yes, you need faith, but you need to add your works, and you need to add these sacraments, and it's faith in conjunction with your works and the grace that the church gives. And there's a reason we're Protestant. We say no to that whatsoever. It's not just because we think we're smarter, it's because we stand on the Bible. Okay, well, I, I don't want to chase that rabbit too far. Anyway, so the SBC was great. We got together. I was there with like-minded men who believe the gospel. They want to see people come to know the Lord. The highlight of every year is on Tuesday morning, we commission the missionaries that go out through the International Mission Board. So I mentioned earlier, all the churches that are part of the SBC give money. That money, one of the things it goes to is the International Mission Board. And so they pay with money from Canon Baptist Church for missionaries to be in places like Iran and Sudan and Macedonia and China. And they can't name all these countries by name. Uh, some of them, they can't even allow the missionary to show their face or use their name or even use their voice because of where they're going is dangerous. And I just want to, if I don't say anything else tonight that interests you, I just want to say thank you, church, for being a part of that. And no dollar, no nickel is insignificant when it's given to a cause to take the gospel to people who've never heard it, who will repent and believe and come to Christ. And I hope you are encouraged as a church that we're a part of this broader effort in the Great Commission. So that, that's the highlight of it. The rest of it's a bunch of, like I said, business meetings and stuff. Now, I did want to point out a couple of things you may have heard the media report on. One of them is there was a measure to make the institutions that take our money uh, tell us in more detail how they're using that money. And for what it's worth, just so you know, I was in full favor of that. Um, the entire room did not vote for it. Maybe next year we will vote for it. I thought, well, this is a small group. We're friends. I thought it was shameful that that was even voted down, quite frankly. I just want you to know as your pastor, uh, the money that we are giving as a church, I think we ought to know exactly where that money goes and how it goes. But I won't go off anymore into that. 
we have next year to try again. By the way, the entities do disclose money. It's not that they don't tell us. It's that there is a group of us within the convention that want them to tell us more than what they currently tell us. So the not I don't want to besmirch our organizations. So that, that came up. Another thing that came up is the law amendment. Now, I'm just curious. Has anybody heard anything about the law amendment? If I said that, does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? Okay, good. I didn't think anybody would raise their hand. Um, this is what's at stake with the law amendment. So, we as Baptists, I mentioned this at the beginning, we want to hold and guard our confession of faith that any churches that get planted with our money are teaching the gospel. But there's a little bit more to it than that. We also want to make sure that the churches that are contributing and the churches that are sending men and women to go be trained to be missionaries and pastors, we want to make sure that the other churches that partner with us believe and teach and preach and have the same practice that we do. So one of the requirements to to give to the cooperative program is that you have to affirm, your church has to have a, a, a statement of faith and a practice that closely aligns with the Baptist faith and message. Now, our church constitution and bylaws has that in it. Our church's statement of faith is the Baptist faith and message 2000. As a matter of fact, uh, when I met with the committee, I think the very first night, I want to say the first question, Brother Elm, was it the first question is, did I affirm the Baptist faith and message 2000? And wholeheartedly, yes, absolutely, yes, I do. It's a great statement of faith. So what is this law mean? Where am I going with all this? Well, we have in the Baptist faith and message, it outlines what are the scriptures? What do we believe about? them? What is a church? What do we believe actually constitutes a church? What is baptism? What should that look like? So, for example, the Baptist faith and message is clear that baptism is for believers only, and it's by immersion. So we don't bring babies forward when they're born and pour water on them and call that baptism. We don't think that's what the scripture teaches. Now our good friends and brothers in Christ at the Presbyterian Church down the road in Royston, they would disagree with us. They would say that's what the scripture teaches baptism is. And we just say, well, you guys are just wrong. That's okay. Dunking is for more than donuts, brother. Um, I have a pastor friend of mine who used to tell his Presbyterian brothers, he said, you know, when y'all go under, I'll come over. Um, <laughs> no, I love, I love our Presbyterian brothers and sisters in Christ, but we disagree on that based on the Scripture. So we think this is what the Scripture teaches. So if a Presbyterian church or the Methodist church across the way there, they may love the Lord and be sincere in their faith, but if they wanted to be part of the Southern Baptist Convention, it's going to be, uh, you know, shrug, pat them on the back, hey, we love you, sorry. Uh, we, we only plant churches and we only send missionaries with churches that agree with us. So that's the, the general scope of things. Now, here's the law amendment. One of the issues that was discovered a few years ago by a pastor in Virginia is that five miles down the road from him was a Southern Baptist church that gave a lot of money that was very vibrant, and yet it ordained women. And furthermore, he, he did a bigger search and he discovered that within just a few miles of his church, there were many Southern Baptist churches that had pastors on staff that were women. And so he wrote to the convention leadership. He asked a lot of questions. He wasn't really getting a lot of the answers that he wanted. And so he proposed an amendment to the constitution of the SBC as a group. And the amendment was simply this, that if a church has a woman of a pastor in any capacity they would not be in friendly cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention. In other words, if that church wants to do what they want to do, that's their business. This Nashville, where the executive committees, they can't tell us anything to do at all. But they can tell us, if we start baptizing babies, they can tell us, hey, good for you, but you can't be a part of the SBC anymore. You forfeit that right once you start baptizing infants. Well, it's in the Confession of Faith, and it's very clear throughout Baptist history and in our documents that the role of pastor is reserved for men. And women are very gifted for ministry in a variety of ways, but the role of pastor, that office, is reserved for men in accordance with the Scriptures. So he proposed an amendment. 
Last year in 2023, it came up for a vote and it got 80% of the vote of the people who were there. So 80% of the people said, yes, we need to put this in the Constitution so that people can't skirt around. It was back up for a vote this year because it had to go two years in a row by a two-thirds vote. And so this year, it only got 61%. And so at some point between last year and this year, I guess a lot of people changed their minds. They found some reason. Uh, I won't bore you with all of their arguments, but essentially it failed by a few hundred votes. That's all it failed. Well, I don't want to spend our time tonight talking about whether or not women are are qualified by scripture to be pastors. I think that's a settled issue in our church, and so I'm not going to spend any time on that. But I did want to give a report on the SBC in terms of the state of things, just so you kind of know where your pastor stands and where I think we as a church stand. I think we proudly are Baptists, and we affirm what the generations of Baptists who came before us affirm as far as about the scripture, the way the church should operate, the way it should function, and who we should partner with. There are others within our large denomination who seem to see things differently. They're not the majority. They're actually a pretty small minority, I think. Uh, but the procedure requires us to have two-thirds, two years in a row, and, and it fell short. So you may be thinking, well, goodness, should we be discouraged about continuing to partner with other Southern Baptist churches? I just want to say, I don't think so. Not yet. Not yet. The majority of the pastors that voted in favor of this law amendment were young. Believe it or not, if you looked at the room, and, and I talked to several guys who were discussing this, the majority, overwhelming, I'd say it's probably 80 or 90 percent of the pastors under 40 and 45 all voted in favor of it. For whatever reason, some of the some of the older pastors who they didn't want to give offense to other people were the ones that voted against it. And I can't speak on behalf of them, but they had a lot of complex arguments that I just didn't, didn't think worked. Well, enough about the Southern Baptist Convention. What I did think would be helpful, though, and, and so all of that is, is just sort of a prelude to this. What I thought it would be helpful for us to do as a church. On Sunday mornings, I'm going to be preaching through Philippians. And when I finish Philippians, I'm, I'm praying about it. We may look at Genesis. We may go to Jonah. We may look at the book of Galatians. I'm still praying and thinking about it. And on Wednesday nights, I thought it would be really helpful if we take and we look at some of the Bible as it's presented in our statement of faith. And so you can think of this as we're going to be teaching and looking at the Bible. But I think it'd be good to just kind of go through, hey, we're a Baptist church. What does it mean to be Baptists? Let's make sure we are standing firm because the seas are changing around us. You know, the big move these days among a lot of churches is to move away from denominational labels and distinctives. But I think they're actually really helpful and good and encouraging us in the faith. I don't think they're a bad thing at all. So uh, we're going to begin kind of looking at the Baptist faith and message. Now, tonight, with a little bit of time we have remaining, Here's what I'd like to do. It's a little unconventional. Um, what I'd like to do is just put your minds at ease in case you have any questions about what is a confession of faith? Why is this important? Why are we even talking about this? I, I want to speak to that just a little bit. So I've talked about the Baptist faith and message and our confession of faith a good bit in all of this background. And you may have the question, what even is a confession of faith? Maybe you didn't realize it's in our church's documents. You may say, what, what is a confession of faith? Well, a confession of faith is simply a helpful summary and a helpful guide that we can use to summarize what it is we believe the Bible teaches. A confession of faith is not our authority. A confession of faith does not stand on top of the Scripture. And a confession of faith is really a voluntary thing that we do. When we read the Bible and it says that we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, and apart from any works, we all come together and we say, I believe the Bible. But you know, other Christians or, or so-called Christians, they will read that same passage 
And they'll say, I believe the Bible. And they'll say, what Paul means there is that it's faith plus works. And so we, we need confessions to help us come together voluntarily, look each other in the eye and say, this is what we believe. This is what we think is a helpful summary or expression of the plain teaching of Scripture. So, you know, you, you've probably heard it said. I've heard, I've heard great and well-meaning Baptist preachers. Adrian Rogers, one of my very favorites. Does anybody remember Adrian Rogers? Am I the only one? Okay, a few hands. All right. He's still fantastic. There's an app, by the way, if you're a little bit tech savvy. There's a Love Worth Finding app where you can listen to sermons all you want to. They're amazing. I don't think I've ever heard a better preacher than Adrian. Anyway, um, I, I heard him say one time, um, yeah, I think it was in the year 2000, so not too long ago, he said, we Baptists, we don't have a creed, we have the Bible. And I love Adrian Rogers. I thought it was kind of funny that he would say that, though, because he was on the committee that helped put together the Baptist faith and message. Now, what he means by that is we don't have a creed, we have a confession of faith. He was trying to make that distinction. So a confession is something you voluntarily say, yes, I think this helpfully summarizes the Bible. So I gave you the example of a Roman Catholic versus our understanding of justification as an illustration of why we need them, why they can be helpful, because you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, you talk to Mormons, and they will say, I believe the Bible. But frankly, folks, when people say that, it's just not enough. It, what do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe the Scriptures teach? And however you answer that is a confession of faith. Whether it's your personal one or whether it's one that we all as a group, as a church, can agree on. So we, we need them. We can't just say, well, no creed but the Bible. I just believe the Bible. Yes, that's true. Now tell me what you believe about it. And that next statement out of your mouth is a type of confession, if you will. The other thing that's helpful about a confession is it's a standard by which we can identify other churches that we want to cooperate with, right? So we can think of a confession as a way of drawing a circle. And yes, it shows us who we don't agree with, right? So we have a confession of faith that outlines what baptism is, and it shows us and explains and helps put in common terms why we think baptism is only for those who've been born again and put their faith in Christ and why it's by immersion. And it draws a circle around that that means Presbyterians aren't inside of that circle. And it draws a circle around what it means to be a, a Baptist church in that we believe in the autonomy of the church. Someone from outside can't dictate to our church how it functions. But a circle doesn't just exclude. A circle also includes. And so by having a confession of faith, we can, we can partner with a church in Virginia, New Mexico, Texas, even across the world. And we can, we can not know anything about that church. But if that church says, you know, we affirm the Baptist faith and message, then with something that simple, we can say, hey, we are like-minded with this church. Now, they may sing different songs than us, may even be in a different language. Uh, they may have a different setup, and they may do different children's activities, but we can in good conscience say, hey, this summary of what we think the Bible teaches lines up with the summary that they also agree on. Now, there's probably a million different preferences where there's a difference. But what that does is it unites us, and we can have immediate kindred spirit with them. And we can cooperate. So that's, that's really what the Baptist faith and message exists to do. And so it's going to exclude non-Trinitarians. So a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon, uh, some of these other heresies that don't believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man. If they came to our church and they wanted to join, they wanted to be a member. And it turns out they don't believe that Jesus was fully God. You know, it might take a lot of questions before that would come out. But if we say, hey, here's our statement of faith, what do you think about that? They're going to read right there near the beginning that we believe Jesus was fully God, fully man. And that person would say, oh, well, I don't believe this. I don't believe Jesus was fully God. And so it also helps us protect our church, helps protect us from error. Now, again, I just want to back up. I, I probably am saying this more than I need to. 
The confession of faith doesn't stand over Scripture. It also does not bind our conscience. So one of the things that makes us Baptists that we're, we'll look at in the coming weeks is, as Baptists, we affirm what's called religious liberty, also soul freedom. Maybe you've heard that phrase, the priesthood of all believers. And what that means is that if you, in good conscience, read the Bible, and you come to a different conclusion before God and in your heart of hearts than the conclusion that I come to, then you and I may have to part ways. We may not be able to do church together, but you should be free to believe what you sincerely believe as far as you can tell the Bible teaches. And so a confession doesn't dictate that you must believe this. A confession is an invitation that says, hey, this is what our church and others like us have believed for hundreds, nay, thousands of years. This is what we stand on. This is how we understand the scripture. Would you like to come and be a part of how we understand the scripture? So in one sense, it's, it's a fence. It's also a gate. It's a stiff arm. But it's also a welcome hand. Hey, come. I have to say, in reading through the Baptist faith and message, I'm always encouraged because it has such good, clear explanations of things in Scripture that, frankly, if we tried to piece it together from all the verses, uh, it might seem like a cloudy picture at times. But a confession of faith takes all of these different verses from different books of the Bible, and it presents them for us in a way that we can read it and say, hey, yeah, that's exactly, that's the way I understand it. I'll also say this, a confession of faith can be helpful uh, to challenge us, because sometimes we read the Bible as best we can, and I don't know about you, but uh, there are times I've believed the wrong things. I won't ask for a show of hands, but have you ever believed something that you thought was surely in the Bible, and then a more seasoned Christian came along and showed you something in the Scripture, and you're like, you know what? I had it wrong. You know, I'm so glad you showed that to me, because... All these years I believed this, and then you showed this to me in the scripture, and guess what? I was wrong. Thank you for showing that to me. We ought to be grateful when that happens. Well, a confession of faith can function that way. So we can read our Bibles, we can be intent on reading it, and then we read in uh, the confession of faith where it's a little bit different than the way we understand it, and we think, okay, well, giants of the faith who knew the Bible inside and out better than I know it, Men like Adrian Rogers, for example, uh, W.A. Criswell, there's so many others in, just in Baptist history. These men studied the scriptures and they were godlier, I'm willing to say, than I am. They know the Bible better than me. They came to a different conclusion. Might I be humble enough to consider their point of view? So confessions can help correct us. So um, in the coming weeks, all this was just kind of a little bit of a setup. In the coming weeks, I want us to go through and look at some of the different articles in the Baptist faith and message. And we will be looking at scripture. We're not just going to read the confession. Again, that, that would be okay. But the great thing about it is there's all these scripture references in our confession of faith. And we're going to look at those and we're going to learn together. And so some of the things in the confession of faith, as a matter of fact, if you're curious what some of the headings are, like what's even in this confession of faith? It's not stuff like, should you use hymns or praise choruses? It doesn't get into that. It's things like, what are the scriptures? And what's their authority? Who is God? What is man? What is mankind? How is a person saved? What is God's purpose of grace in the world? What's the role of the church? What is baptism? What is the Lord's Supper? Uh, there's items in there about the kingdom of God about last things, about evangelism and missions, and I could go on and on. We may not look at all of them, but we, we will begin at least a series uh, next week. And we're going to look at the very first one, which is the scriptures. Now, I meant to ask someone before tonight. Brother Larry, you may know the answer to this. Or Miss Debbie, actually, you would, you would, I think, definitely know. Do you know if we have copies of the Baptist Faith and Message? I've seen little pocket copies at some churches before. Do you know if we have any of those? Okay, I was thinking the association might. Um, so I want to get some copies of that, and, and you can have it. Like I said, it's already in our church documents, but 
How many of you go home and read the church constitution bylaws every week? Yeah, nobody. I don't blame you. But I think it'd be good to have, you can have it as a helpful guide. And you know what? It can be helpful in sharing your faith, talking to your family members, things like that. So we'll, we'll look through these things. Um, I do want to conclude with, um, in thinking about these things, with Hebrews chapter 10. So in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near just in conclusion I know uh, Pastor Mitch preached through Hebrews great sermons I got to listen to several of them so I won't preach a mini sermon here. I encourage you to go back if you if you have time. Go back and listen to his sermon on Hebrews 10. But this exhortation at the end of Hebrews is let us hold fast what we've been taught. Let us guard it. Let us joyfully believe it. Why? For he who promised is faithful. We want to hold on, but at the end of the day, it's it's the Lord holding on to us. We want to be faithful. We entrust ourselves to him to keep us faithful and to keep us in the faith. And in light of holding on to that confession of hope, in light of holding on to that, notice what the outworking is. Let us consider how to stir one another up or stir up one another to love and good works. If we want the life and the vitality of our church to be strong vibrant and robust you know where we start we start with studying the bible knowing what we believe and holding on to it with tenacity lest anyone would try to take this from us because these are the words of life when jesus in john chapter 6 at the end of john chapter 6 jesus had given some very very hard statements some very very hard statements and it says that some of the people heard it and they kind of grumbled and they said, this is a hard statement. Who can accept this? And it says, many who had followed him left and they quit following him and they departed. And Jesus looked at the 12 and he says, are you going to go away also? And they said, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of life. So in conclusion, as we think about. As we think about confessions, and again, the bigger picture is the SBC, but that's kind of behind us. As we think about confessions, and we think about what we mutually affirm, we do it because it's the words of life, and they give us life. So I promise to you I will do my best to make sure that none of it will be a dry and boring and dusty, uh, you know, some kind of theological thing that puts everybody to sleep. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about next week is the scripture. And uh, I, I can't wait. So we'll, we'll look at that next week, and, and I'll, we'll be with you then. Uh, at this time, let me pray, and then I'm going to have, Joe, are you here yet? We'll have Joe come forward and do the prayer request, but let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. I thank you for our church. I thank you that your people here want to know your scripture. Lord, I thank you that we have a hunger and a thirst for your word. I pray you would continue to cultivate that in our hearts. And I pray that we would joyfully confess your truth to one another and to those around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.